38 through 40. We're going to use the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. God bless you for being with us on this Resurrection Sunday. If it is your first Sunday, I hope you got a visitor bag that gives you extra information about who we are. If you didn't get one, make sure you get one of these go out the door. And I pray that you fill out the visitor card, either you did it digitally or you can do it physically. And leave it with us as you go. If you're looking for a home church, you found it. Amen? Amen. If, you're looking for, if you're looking for just an institution, there's plenty. But if you're looking for a family, here you are. Come on. Amen? Amen. So, so Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 40, here's what we read. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want a sign from you. But he answered them and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Catch this. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Can you say amen to the reading of his word? Yes. Y'all ready for some word this morning? Yes. Don't make me preach alone today. Y'all ready for the word? Yes, great. Now, all month long, we have been reflecting on our need for a Savior. Right. Our need for our sins to be atoned for. Right. Sin which we cannot turn over a new leaf for. Sin that we can't use the power of positive thinking to overcome. Yes. Sin that we cannot deliver ourselves from through therapy. All right. All right. The spiritual wages of our sin is death. Physically, yes, but spiritually more so. In that it cuts us off from God and from our place with Him in eternity. Yes. We learned this month that, that no money could pay that wage. No service or deed we can do could pay that wage. No connections or powerful influences could dismiss that wage. No mere human could pay it for me because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the sinner cannot pay the price for another sinner. We needed saving. We needed someone to pay the wages for our sins or else. So we learn that God, in His profound love, sent Jesus. He was God the Word. God the Son. And He became one of us, yet did not sin like us. And as the representative of all mankind, He went to the cross, offered up His own life as the payment for the wages of the sin of all mankind. Yes. He shed his blood to redeem us. Is there a church that still believes that here this morning? Yes. And so what we know about Jesus the Christ is this. For those who repent, turn to him, and call upon him for salvation, he washes in his blood. Yes. Are you washed in the blood this morning? Yes. We sang about it on Friday night. We talked about it on Friday night. I've been preaching it all month long. Amen. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it is by His blood that the sinner becomes the saint. The unrighteous becomes righteous. The lost is now found. The one destined for hell now has a place in heaven. Those who are in darkness have been transferred into his marvelous light. Those who are afar off have been drawn near. Those who are a stranger have become a friend of God. The orphan is now a son because of the cross, because of his sacrifice, because of the blood he sheds. You can be saved. Who can be saved? Even all who call upon the name of the Lord. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. And I, I'm a child in the 70s, and I'm thankful for it. And, and maybe there's a few of you, well, y'all are more like child of the 50s and 60s. But I'm a child of the 70s. And during the 70s, we used to have 
We used to have this program system that was a joy as a kid in the 70s. And that was that if you found a box that said on it, return for deposit, or it had on the side, redeemable, you could take that bottle to the local corner store and turn it in and get five cents back. Now, early on, it was five cents. I remember when they jumped to six, and that was gold. What that meant for me is having a mom who was a housewife and a dad who was a blue-collar worker. My parents weren't fixing to give me any money for camp. I wouldn't even ask. It crossed my mind. But if I found a bottle, I took it to the local corner store, and I turned it in, and I got five cents. And normally I just said, forget the money. I went and grabbed five cents worth of candy. <laughs> because back in those days, one blob of double bubble bubble gum cost one cent. <laughs> a, a peppermint twist cost one cent. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Right? So that means if I found a bottle and I took it to the corner store, I had a pocket full of peppermint twists. <laughs> now you turned in four bottles. Back then, a Snicker bar was 20 cents. Oh, you were in heaven. <laughs> I didn't have money, but if I turned in four bottles, I got me a Snicker bar. And that was just how we did back in those days. One of the bag of chips, one of the soda, one of something that, that your parents weren't about to buy for you. But you're walking down the street, you look down in the ditch, there's a discarded bottle, you picked it up, you washed it, you ran to the store, and you got you some candy. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And, and so, so summer days that were joyful was getting with your buddies and uh, riding your bikes up and down the streets and around the dumpsters and behind the store looking for discarded bottles, yeah. collecting a bunch, going to the store just buying some junk. Uh -huh. Amen? Yeah. And I, one day it hit me about these bottles because I was like that discarded soda bottle in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And you were like that discarded soda bottle in the 70s. Uh -huh. Used, emptied, and tossed to the side. Oh, Pastor Preach. But Jesus is like those kids in the 70s seeking and saving that which has value to him. Yeah. He seeks after us. He finds us on the roadside bleeding out. He finds us in the pit bin. He finds us behind the money changer tables. He finds us alone and ostracized at the well, and he takes that discarded. This says this one is redeemable, and he washes it and refills it. Amen. And the ultimate reason he is able to say to the uttermost is because after he completed the will of the Father on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead alive, resurrected. Somebody shout resurrected. Because if he had not resurrected, he would have just been another Jew executed by the Romans. If he had not been resurrected, his blood would have spilled and dried on the hot Israeli soil. If he had not been resurrected, his death at best would just be an obscure note in the history books. If he had not been resurrected, he could have done nothing that day to help the thief hanging by his side. If he had not been resurrected, he could not have offered hope nor condolences to the weeping women at the foot of the cross. If he had not been resurrected, he could offer no restoration to Peter after he had denied him. And we, if he had not been resurrected, would still be struggling to find a way to atone for the sins that separate us from a holy God. We'd still be living in fear of death and the reality of hell hanging over our heads. But we have gathered here to celebrate the truth that he did die, he did shed his blood, he was buried in the grave, but on the third day he arose again. Is anybody here to testify? 
And listen, by rising, the cross was made more powerful. By rising, his blood was made eternal. By rising, his promises are ensured. By rising, his ability to save is sure. By rising, his presence in the throne room of God is our reality. And by rising, his coming back again is our blessed hope. Yes. And you believe he's arrived, arisen. Yes. Jesus the Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, and coming back. Yes. Hey, say that out loud with me. This is what we declare. Yes. Jesus the Christ, say it. Crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, and coming back. Can we let the devil know what we're declaring? Let's say it again. Jesus the Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, and he's coming back. Come on, shout for joy for him. Yes. So in Matthew 29, we find the scene where the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests and the Sadducees, they come to Jesus and, and they, they demand a sign from him. They said, show us a sign so we may know you are who you say you are. They couldn't trap him in his words, though they tried. They couldn't win an argument with him on doctrine, but they tried. They were not able to stand against his wisdom. In fact, the crowd said, we've never heard anybody teach with such authority. Others said, never before has anybody spoken like this man. But for the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they said, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, show us a sign to prove it. Never mind that sitting in the crowd was a man named Bartimaeus who had lived as a blind man until he had met Jesus. Yes. Never mind that there was among the leaders with them yes. that one named Jairus whose baby girl had been dead till Jesus came into the house. Never mind that sitting in the audience was a man named Lazarus yes. who was dead in the grave for four days until Jesus showed up at his graveside and called him out. Yeah. Never mind that there were ten men in the crowd. Him clean after they had been cleansed from their leprosy through Jesus on their way. Never mind that there was amongst them a centurion in the city who was managing crowd control that day, who had seen his servant healed only at the word of Jesus. Never mind that there were countless faces among the multitude who remember being fed by this Jesus after he multiplied five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000. Never mind the testimonies, thousands of them, who those who were healed and delivered from demons and forgiven and restored, they still wanted a sign. Are you with me this morning? Jesus wasn't in the mood for performing parlor tricks for a religious crowd whose hearts were hardened and who were bent on discrediting Jesus. He said the only sign that you're going to get is the prophet, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Y'all know about Jonah? Y'all know the story of Jonah? Jonah was being sent by God to bring a message of repentance to Nineveh. He tried to run from God's will, but he found himself swallowed by a great fish, one that God had prepared, and he spent three days in the belly of the fish. But on the third day, everybody shout third day. He came out alive and preached and brought repentance to an entire city. Jesus, also like Jonah, was sent with, by God with a message of repentance. But unlike Jonah, he submitted to the will of God. And according to the plan prepared for him by God, he went into the grave three days. His resurrection brought escape from the wrath for all who repent. And this, Jesus said, is the sign. When you see me in the grave for three days, only to come out alive, that's the sign you'll get to prove that I am who I say I am. Come on, somebody. Do you need a sign this morning? Is anybody here needing another sign? Do you believe he is who he says he is and he will do what he said he will do? 
Because if you haven't come to Jesus this morning, and you haven't let him save you and redeem you, maybe you're still waiting on the side. If you're here this morning and you're living with skepticism and doubt, maybe it's because you're needing another side. If you're here today and you're fearful and anxious and unsure about the future, perhaps you're demanding another side. If you're here and you're on the fence looking for options pulled by every cultural wind that blows, maybe you're just waiting for another sign. Maybe you're saying, prove to me, Jesus, that you are who you say you are and will do what you say you will do. Oh, come on, somebody. Maybe we're like the religious elite who looked down their noses until Jesus met their demands. Maybe we're like the many who encountered him, though, and knew that there is something about this Jesus. Is anybody here with a made-up mind that there's something about him? Many encountered Jesus in the Gospels and had something to say about him. The woman at the well said, come see a man. Could this be the Christ? The disciples on the sea said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The multitude said, we've never heard somebody teach with such authority. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Even the demons said, we know who you are, the son of the most high. The centurion at the cross said, truly, this man was a righteous man. Thomas said of him, my Lord and my God. What do you say about Jesus this morning? What would your mouth declare about this Jesus this morning? Do you know him like that? I'm making, uh, giving you a reminder of what we preach and what we have come to believe by faith. The Holy Spirit bearing witness, his word declaring. Let me say it again to a new generation that Jesus was the word from the beginning with God and being God. And by him all things were created. And by him all things consist. He is before all things, having existed in eternity past without beginning or end. He is present through the Old Testament in every type, shadow, prophecy, and promise. He was sent by the Father to earth to become man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. He was God incarnate. God become human flesh. 100% man, 100% God in the person of Jesus Christ. Thus, he was the only begotten son of the Father. He operated as a prophet, speaking truth by the Spirit. Born of the lineage of King David, he was of royal line. He lived a sinless life, fulfilling the law. He became the Lamb of God who offered willingly his life on behalf of all on the cross. He died physically on the cross according to the determined plan of God. He was buried physically. He went into the heart of the earth. He preached there to the Old Testament saints who were waiting for their redemption. He rose bodily on the third day alive. He showed himself with many infallible proofs. He ascended 40 days after his resurrection into heaven to return to his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. He is in the throne room as our high priest. He's ever interceding for us. He's offering his eternal blood on our behalf. He's coming back again in power to retrieve his church, who's those who have been born again, and all things will be given into his hand. Before him, all will bow. And even he alone is King of kings and Lord of of lords he is not a way he is the way he's not one of many he is the one and only he is not a mere alternative he's the only means of salvation he's not a side gig but in him we live and move and have our being come on somebody 
That's why we know him as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher, the author of eternal salvation, the captain of our salvation, the great shepherd of the sheep, the bishop of our souls, our way maker, our high priest, our advocate, our intercessor, our redeemer, our savior. He is our victory. He is our defense. He is our protector. He is our provider. He is the baptizer with the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to tell you the only sign this preacher ever needs has already happened. Somebody got to praise him this morning. Y'all act like y'all don't know who I'm talking about. He is the risen Savior. He, not Confucius. He, not Gandhi. He, not Joseph Smith. He, not Reverend Moon. He, not the Buddha. He, Jesus the Christ, died, was buried, but rose alive after three days in the grave. And he's alive today, resurrected. Somebody shout resurrected. And I want to point out some stuff today that Jesus not only knew when he came to earth that he would die on the cross, but he also knew that he would rise again. It didn't come all of a sudden. It wasn't a shock to everybody. Hebrews tells us that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross and despised the shame. That's why Jesus was able to tell the religious leaders to watch for the sign. Just like Jonah was in the fish for three days, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth, but only for three days. He said it again in Matthew 16 and 21. He showed his disciples how he would suffer from the elders and priests and scribes and be killed, but raised again the third day. In Matthew 17, he says it again. He lets them know the Son of Man will be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised up. In Mark 9 and 9, he says it again, coming off the Mount of Transfiguration, that they should tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. He said it again in John chapter 2, verse 9. He used this imagery. He said, destroy the temple, but in three days I will raise it up again. And they didn't understand, but the scripture says that he was talking about his own body. Even the religious leaders understood at his trial his claim that he would rise again. That's why when Jesus was placed in the tomb, the religious leaders understood that Jesus had spoken about his resurrection, and that's why they begged Pilate Put a, put a guard at that place. Because he said something about three days and we can't afford for he to be telling the truth. And so they put a guard at the tomb and say, we can't have an empty tomb on our hands. Because if that tomb comes up empty, his followers will be more energized than before. If the tomb comes up empty, there's no way we'll be able to stop what he started. If the tomb comes up empty, we'll really be in a bind to explain away the teachings of this man, Jesus. So we need to seal that tomb and put a guard at the entrance for at least three days. See, for them, they needed to make sure that it was over and done. But the only one it was over and done for was Satan. And I believe that Satan knew that if Jesus made it past the cross, he would be defeated forever. Because his best weapons, his arsenal of sin, his death and grave would be neutralized. I wonder if Satan took it personal when Jesus was hanging on the cross and cried out, It is finished. I wonder if Satan took it, got his feelings hurt, uh, that Jesus said, it is finished. Devil, your, shenag your shenanigans against mankind is finished. Your sting of sin and rebellion are done. The death and destruction you have wielded against man is over. The finality of the grave is no more. It is finished. And the guard was set at the tomb. But guess what? 
They may have had a guard on the outside of the tomb, but they couldn't stop what was happening on the walls of the other side of the tomb. They couldn't set a gate at the gates, a guard at the gates of the lower parts of the earth in the spiritual realm where scripture says Jesus entered with redemption's news. He preached the gospel to those who were held captive there and they met their redeemer. Jesus invaded death hell and the grave and by rights took the keys to victory over death hell and the grave satan knew jesus was coming and that he would resurrect in victory forever turning the tides of favor in mankind's behalf resurrected somebody shot resurrected ha huh. so he he has always had resurrection power working in him he is even now in the resurrection business. Thank God. Not only the promise, the promise that says that the very same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead will one day make our mortal bodies alive and we're going to resurrect. In fact, he from uh, John, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection and first fruit implies more to come. And because of his resurrection, you and I who die in Christ will also resurrect. But listen, not only that promise, but when Jesus saves us in a sense, he also resurrects us. Have you been resurrected? Let me say that again. When Jesus saves us, he also, in a sense, resurrects us. And that's the beauty of water baptism. When we get into the water and we go under the water as if we are dying, and then we come up out of the water as a symbol of resurrection, two things are happening at this beautiful act of water baptism. Number one, we are testifying that we believe and identify with Jesus who was buried and who rose again. But the second thing we are testifying, it is our public testimony that we have been born again. And by born again, we believe that if any man is in Christ now, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And therefore, when I'm born again, my old man has died. It's been crucified with Jesus. I have died with him in baptism. So when I go under the water, I'm letting everyone know my old me, the old drunk, the old cusser, the old fornicator, the old adulterer, the old gambler, the old liar, the old thief, the old cheat. He's dead now, and we are burying him. Come on, somebody. Y'all better. And out of the water comes forth the new man who's now righteous and sanctified, made holy, is sainted, has his name written in the Lamb's book of life, has a place in heaven, is now called a son. That's the new man. And so when we come to Christ, the old man dies, the new man is resurrected. Have you been resurrected in the house? Shout amen. Am I going too fast for the translator? Let's start from the top. <laughs> Resurrected. Jesus has always been in the business of resurrecting lives. Here's what I want to talk to you this morning. Have you been resurrected? When we come to Jesus, he will not only resurrect us to new life, but sometimes that new birth is an act where God gets us unstuck. He'll reroute us on a new path. He'll repurpose us to missional and meaningful life. And throughout the Gospels, we see he doing this, like the woman uh, at name, the widow woman who lost her son 
You can read about it in the Gospels. She was already a widow, which was against her. But now she had lost her only son. He was her security. He was her insurance for the future. And now he was dead. She had no legal rights. She had no means. Who knew what the future held? But it didn't look good for the widow woman at Nain. But one day Jesus shows up at the funeral. He not only resurrected her son back to life, but he resurrected the widow's future, putting her back on path for a path of hope. He's still in the business, and he'll do the same for you. Or like the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all know about her? Years had gone by, and she had found no cure. She spent everything she had on the doctors and still no answer. She's now penniless, but she's still sick. She's spent out, but she's still sick. She's knocked on every door in town, but she's still sick. And her disease was such that it rendered her socially unclean. That is, she could not interact with society, engage in social circles, or pursue a career path that involved being around people. She spent her last dime, and it was also her last hope. Her dreams were over. Her career plans squashed. Her intent of re-engaging again one day in society were dead. But that's at least until she heard that Jesus was walking by. And it was just the hem of his garment that she touched, but he resurrected her dreams and her future and her hope. God can do the same for you this morning, church. What about the prodigal son? Y'all know that story? Yeah, the prodigal son. The parable is not about somebody getting saved. I'll tell you that right now. The prodigal son is about someone who backslides and departs from the living God, finding themselves lost and dead. The son, he lived in the father's house. He had a place in the father's house. He had access to everything the father had. But one day he chose to leave his father's house and go out into the world. He partied. He slept around. He gambled. He spared no expense at luxurious living. He ran out of money. The sinners that he had latched onto now abandoned him. He took a job slopping hogs, but he was so hungry that he was now digging in the hog slop to find a piece of corn or something to eat. That was a pretty low state, but it was there that he realized, wait a minute, I was once in my father's house, and I had a warm bed, and I had three meals a day, and I had servants to take care of my laundry, and I had access to my relationship with my family, and here I am in the pig pen. What am I doing here? I'm going to get up out of this place. I have found myself dead and lost, but maybe my dad will show me mercy. And so we look at the prodigal in the pig pen and we ask, is it over for the prodigal? Is his chapter closed? Is all hope been lost? And I say, not as long as the father is in the resurrection business. He comes to himself. He makes himself way back to the father. The father's waiting on him, ready to restore and put him back in his proper place. Look at Luke 15 and 24. I, I, it's a resurrection statement. The father says, for this my son was dead and now is what? Alive He's alive again and was lost but now is found. He was resurrected. He was alive, found himself dead, but now he's alive again. Let me tell you, if you're in the house and you think you've gone too far, if you're in the house and think you've strayed too long, if you think it's been too long since you've been in the body of Christ, you think that maybe God's written you off or forgotten. No, he knows your name. And he's got a in his closet a robe with your name on it. He's never forgotten you. And he's in the resurrection business. And he wants to resurrect your place in him and resurrect your relationship with him. He's calling you home this morning because he is into prodigals being restored. My wife could come to the piano. I don't know if there's any prodigals in the house. 
that God brought you into this place this morning for a great resurrection celebration. I don't know if there's anyone in the house that's here because you know that it's time to start working your way or making your way towards God. And that's great. But the truth is, only he can resurrect you from the old man in sin and resurrect you to a new creature through the new birth. You can't turn over a new leaf. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't even come to church enough to be born again. If church alone got us saved, he wouldn't have come to the cross. Stand with me this morning, church. Everybody say resurrected. I preach this message because really as a pastor this year, last year was 30 years of consistent pastoring. And if you add on assistant pastoring, probably another 33, 34 years total preaching this gospel. And I'm old enough now and secure in who I am in Christ as a minister to just say it like this. I'm so tired of the gospel being misrepresented of every teacher who can do YouTube channel and everyone who could be a blogger and a vlogger having a platform to teach this and that every which way, all kinds of strange ideas and watering down the pure gospel and the truth of who Jesus is. And that's why I declare him to you. He is the eternal son of God, preexisted with the Father, came down by the plan and will of God and gave himself on the cross, literally died and shed his blood, not for a group of elect or a handful, but for the whole world. physically died, literally went to the tomb, physically, literally rose from the grave bodily, ascended to the right hand of glory, back where he came from, from the beginning, and there he is, our eternal high priest, offering up eternal blood. That means there's no sin that I can do more powerful. There's no sin that I can do that outweighs the power of his blood to cleanse and to redeem. Did you hear that this morning, guys? And a new generation needs to know he's coming back for his own. Every head bowed, Father, in the name of Jesus. I'm not worthy to be counted as one who joins with the apostles of the church who preach the first message on the day of Pentecost of the crucified but risen Savior crying out that men ought to repent. The message hasn't changed. We preach it again in 2024. We just smile on City Mission as a place where truth is taught, preached, and embraced. Smile in such a way, Lord, that this is a place you can trust for men to come to Christ and be discipled. Even this morning, every head bowed, I won't ask if Ferdinand would come if he comes. I will come, be ready to pray. This morning, if uh, Scott wants to come, if Bonnie wants to come, if you are available this morning, you can stand across. Or even you're here, God, you can stand by your husband. They're up here ready to pray for you pray for us together. With every head bowed, if you're here this morning, say, Pastor, I, I, I really believe what you're preaching. I've never made that step to accept Christ in my life and ask Him to cleanse me. I'm here to tell you He wants to do it more than, than we want to see it happen. God's not willing for anybody to perish, but all come to repentance is what His Word says. It's the will of God, the command of God that all men everywhere repent. That's His Word. 
And so he also promised that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, he in no ways will cast out. But whosoever calls upon his name for salvation shall be saved. So you can walk out of this room on this Resurrection Sunday saved. Your name written in the book of life. Your sins washed no matter how dark or how many gone. It's a clean slate. If you're ready to come and pray, confess Christ. Confess your belief that He alone can save you. He'll do it right here on the spot. Wow. Come be resurrected. I'm going to pray. We're going to pray one more time. And if that's you, come. If you're here and you're that prodigal, you know what it is to dwell in the Father's house and have fellowship with Him. And you just thought you would, just a temporary season, take a break and go out there. And you brutally have been bruised and beaten, emptied and spent. All along, the Father's been here. He hasn't gone anywhere. He loves you. If that's you today, say, Father, I'm ready. Just come on home. Why don't you come kneel? These guys will pray with you one-on-one. No spectacle made you and Jesus. I'm going to pray first. And then if that's you, while I'm praying, come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking, Lord, that by your Spirit, you would draw hearts, that you would convict of sin and judgment righteousness, that you, Lord, would pull the scales off eyes and that you would reveal Christ and all his glory to hearts this morning. Father, that that inner hunger in people's souls for relationship with you, that they would understand that you want this, that you desire relationship, and that you've done what's necessary to remove the barrier of sin. Speak to us today, Lord, and God, do your work. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. If you're in the house and you need special prayer, if you want healing in your body or you need agreement in prayer, our prayer partners are up here to pray with you. I believe.